In this lecture, I would like to talk about Galileo as a physicist. Galileo had an insatiable curiosity about the world, indeed, like all physicists, physicists, and he believed that we can learn about it by careful observation and by accurate measurement. The results of measurements can be used to find relationships between the quantities measured, and these in turn can be used to develop and test theories about the behavior of phenomena. And he applied this method to a wide range of phenomena. This combination of physical insight and mathematical description is the essential feature of modern science. It is not enough to have a physical description of a phenomenon, for this may be plausible but wrong. Neither is it adequate to have a set of mathematical rules that describe the measurable features accurately but give no physical insight, for there may be several sets that do this equally well. We only have a real understanding when both are combined, and even then it may appear later on that it is not a complete understanding and that our knowledge has to be developed to cover still wider ranges of phenomena. It is not always easy to reconstruct exactly what Galileo did and his motives for doing so. It is extremely difficult, if not impossible, for us to think ourselves back into the mindset of the past, to know the mental background, to know what was taken for granted and what was implicitly denied, to understand what sort of arguments were accepted as valid and the criteria used to separate truth from falsity. If we are to distinguish between genuine discovery and mere copying, we need to know what had already been discovered and how widely these previous discoveries were known. It is nearly always possible to find many precursors who had some partial or even quite accurate knowledge of what is claimed as a new discovery. Quite often the person recognized as a discoverer has taken some idea already known, rephrased it more clearly, demonstrated it by well-chosen experiments, and then has publicized it in a particular arresting and cogent way. In the case of Galileo, we have his, his extensive writings, but when we read them, especially in translation, we are faced with the problem of knowing just what the words mean. There is an ever-present danger that we use our present knowledge of physics to read into his experiments and motives ideas that were not his. He used the terms to describe his work that are often translated by modern terms that have precise meanings that are unlikely to correspond to those in Galileo's mind. The whole process of scientific discovery is mysterious even to the scientists themselves. When we are wrestling to understand some strange phenomenon, we think about it for weeks and months, trying one idea after another until finally the light dawns. All these intermediate stages are soon forgotten, so it is impossible even for scientists themselves to recreate the process. Certainly it is not present in the dry logical account that is written up for publication. These difficulties are particularly acute in the case of Galileo, for he inherited the mainly qualitative science of the Middle Ages and was largely responsible for transforming it into the quantitative science we know today. The concepts used to describe motion, for example, were not clearly understood and only gradually achieved the clarity we know today. The ideas defining the concept of impetus and inertia developed over the years from the work of Buridan to that of Galileo and the degree of continuity and discontinuity is still disputed. In some cases, it is doubtful whether Galileo actually performed the experiments he described. They are more in the nature of thought experiments designed to clarify his ideas and to convince others of their truth. He undoubtedly made some experiments in order to understand the phenomena he was studying. And when he believed that he had attained this understanding, he deduced the consequences for other situations which he had not studied. 
Many of his experiments were technically difficult for him, since he did not have available the simple measuring instruments that we now take for granted. It was comparatively easy to measure distances, for example, in his studies of falling bodies. But it was very difficult to measure the short times at all accurately. The inevitable uncertainties in his results then made it more difficult to be sure that any relationship that he found is the only one possible. There is also the ever-present difficulty of removing or allowing for the effects of extraneous influences. In the course of his work, Galileo designed and made many ingenious new instruments and frequently had them manufactured in his workshop for sale. An example is an early form of thermometer and various quadrants and magnetic compasses. He also applied his knowledge of levers to simple machines and his, in his book on mechanics he described the windlass, the capstan, the screw and the Archimedean screw. Galileo's earliest biographer Viviani claimed that in 1582 when he was still a medical student at Pisa he observed the motion of the swinging lamp in the cathedral. Using his pulse to measure the time of swing, he found that it is independent of the amplitude of the swing, providing that this is small. This is a rather surprising result, as it implies that it takes the same time for the pendulum to reach the nadir of its swing, however far it is drawn aside before release. According to Viviani, this suggested to him that a pendulum could be used to measure the pulse rate. There is, however, no other evidence for this story, as Galileo first mentioned the isochronous no nature of the pendulum in a letter in 1602. He also showed that the period of swing is independent of the material of the pendulum and that the period is proportional to the square root of the length of the string. Galileo also compared the swing of the pendulum with the motion of a ball that runs down one inclined plane and up another one opposite to it. In another investigation, he found that the times of descent are equal for all chords from the highest or to the lowest points of a vertical circle. Galileo's earliest work on mechanics was his De Mutu of 1592, which is devoted to a discussion of the fall of bodies in media of different densities. In this work, he was much influenced by the ideas of the Jesuits at the Collegio Romano, whose lecture notes he used extensively. They held with Aristotle that the aim of science is the understanding of natural phenomena in terms of evident principles, and Galileo continued to accept this throughout his life. However, he strongly opposed the arid textual Aristotelians found in the universities, and it is against them that his polemics are directed. His De Mutu is largely a detailed analysis of the writings of Aristotle on the subject of motion. And after about 40 dis pages of discussion, he exclaims, Heavens, at this point I am weary of and ashamed of having to use so many words to refute such childless arguments and such inept attempts at subtleties as those which Aristotle crams into the whole book four of De Cello, as he argues against older philosophers. For his arguments have no force, no learning, no elegance or attractiveness, and anyone who has understood what was said above will recognize their fallacies. End of quotation. Later on he remarks that Aristotle was ignorant not only of the profound and more abstruse discoveries of geometry, but even of the most elementary principles of this science. A few pages later, discussing how projectiles are moved, he remarks, Aristotle, as in practically everything that he wrote about locomotion, wrote the opposite of the truth. And that, of course, was not likely to endear him to the Aristotelian philosophers of the time. At that time, however, Galileo apparently thought that each of the cases he discussed was characterized by a constant velocity, 
rather than a constant acceleration. He also accepted the current but false belief that if a light and a heavy body were dropped together, the light body will initially move more rapidly than the heavier, and so devoted several pages to ingenious arguments to explain why this happened. If indeed there is experimental evidence for this effect, it probably occurs because the heavy body has to be held more tightly than a light body and so tends to be released a little later. Galileo developed his views on motion throughout his life and his mature conclusions are described in his Discorsi of 1638 that in many respects is a precursor of Newtonian mechanics. The transition from medieval to Newtonian mechanics is thus largely due to him. Since ancient times, there was much discussion concerning the rate of fall of bodies towards the earth. Study of this natural motion was an essential preliminary to the discussion of the forced or unnatural motion of projectiles. Aristotle suggested that the speed of free fall, v, is proportional to the weight w of the body and inversely proportional to the resistance r of the medium. It is however not justified to conclude that v is equal to k w over r, where k is a constant, since he also believed that the motion is accelerated. The velocity increases as the body approaches its natural place. Some medieval commentators suggested that the velocity is proportional to the d fall, distance d fallen, which would give v is equal to k d w over r, but this connection was not made. The philosophers in Oxford and Paris in the 14th century succeeded in formulating the odd number rule for the distances traversed by a uniformly accelerated falling body in equal times. And this is equivalent to saying that the distance traversed is proportional to the square of the time, an achievement usually attributed to Galileo. The medievals had no means, however, of measuring acceleration, and there was no justification for assuming that freely falling bodies are uniformly accelerated, so this was no more than a speculation. These discussions went on for centuries without much progress because few, if any, ex actual experiments were made. The complications due to the resistance of the medium were not properly understood and there was no clearly defined concept of acceleration. Thus what is now a trivial exercise for 13-year-old students was still a problem exercising the minds of the leading philosophers of nature. It was not difficult to show that the ab above expressions for the velocity have unacceptable implications. They imply, for instance, that in a vacuum, when the resistance is zero, the velocity would be infinite, which incidentally provided Aristotle with his argument for the impossibility of a vacuum. And also that two bodies of equal weight falling side by side would double their velocity if joined together. Furthermore, if the medium is denser than the body, the latter will rise and not fall. We can now see that the resistance in a particular medium is not a well-defined quantity, as it depends on the size, shape, and surface roughness of the body, and also on its velocity and internal motion. Even today, this remains a very complicated problem. Since the resistance increases with the velocity, it eventually equals the gravitational force, so that after falling a certain distance, the velocity becomes constant. This is obvious if we consider a metal ball or a feather falling through treacle, but it also applies to free fall in air. For example, the probability of survival of a cat that has the misfortune to fall out of the window becomes a constant for falls from more than about seven floors. This attainment of a terminal velocity was recognized by Galileo in his writings, although he thought that it is achieved more rapidly than it is. <laughs>
To make any progress, it is therefore necessary to consider the situation where the resistance of the medium can be neglected. Galileo noticed that bodies of different materials and shapes fall with very different velocities in dense materials, but at about the same velocity in air. This is supported by his experiments with a pendulum. He then conjectured that in a vacuum all vo bodies would fall with the same speed. The motion is then independent of the medium and of the nature, size and shape of the body. It is of course impracticable to make measurements in a vacuum, but this is approximately true for the small fall of smooth, heavy spherical bodies through short distances in air. Ideally, we could make measurements in air of a decreasing density and then extrapolate to zero density. There is always, as in most experiments in physics, a final leap from the best we can achieve to the ideal situation. Thus, most of physics refers to an ideal platonic world and not to the real world, a distinction that is seldom recognized, sometimes with disastrous results. This is directly contrary to Aristotelian physics, which is concerned with what normally happens, which implies that it is not possible to learn anything about natural motion by considering a situation, however ideal, that does not ex actually exist. Throughout his work, Galileo made use of the principle that the laws of nature are simple. Thus, the laws of nature must be expressed by simple formula. In some contexts, however, this led him astray, as when he rejected Kepler's conclusion that the planetary orbits are ellipses and not circles. Galileo's views on motion went through several stages. At first, he believed that natural motion has a natural uniform speed proportional to the difference between the density of the moving object and that of the medium. As the effective density is diminished by the medium, so is the natural uniform speed. Non-natural motions are due to an impressed force, and this is responsible for the initial acceleration. These views constituted a coherent philosophy of motion, but Galileo could not find a simple, single example of this uniform motion, and so concluded that acceleration is a feature of all motion. He concluded, he considered the possibility that the velocity is directly proportional to the distance, but soon rejected this possibility. Then, from the mean speed theorem, which implies that the acquired velocity is proportional to the time taken, he deduced that the distance covered is proportional to the square of the time taken. There has been some controversy about whether Galileo actually performed any experiments related to free fall. It is suggested that since he already knew that the distance traveled is proportional to the square of the time, the actual experiment was undertaken just to confirm that result. It is certainly true that many of Galileo's earlier statements about motion were the result of thought experiments. He believed that ideas suggested by simple observations are often misleading and that they must be tested by mathematical reason. Later on, he realized the need for carefully planned experiments. Galileo soon found that it was very difficult, if not impossible, for him to measure with sufficient accuracy the time taken for bodies to fall. He therefore hit on the very ingenious idea of timing them as they rolled down planes inclined at different angles. The times to be measured are then much longer, and so could be measured more accurately. He could make experiments for a series of increasing angles, and then extrapolate the results to find the rate for free fall. This experiment is indeed quite practicable, as shown by Settle, who repeated these experiments in 1961. Even then, it was not measure easy to measure the times. Eventually, he did this by weighing the amount of water that spurted out of a pipe 
from a small hole near the bottom of a large jar of water. He stopped the hole with his finger, removed it when the ball started, and stopped the flow when the ball had traversed the prescribed distance. After many hundreds of trials, he found that the distance traversed is indeed proportional to the square of the time taken for all angles, although, of course, the constant of proportionality varied with the angle. Although Galileo did not recognize this, it was not possible to extrapolate the constant of proportionality to obtain that from free fall, what we know, now know as the acceleration as due, due to gravity. Because when the balls rolled down the plane, some of their potential energy was converted into rotational energy and not to kinetic energy to move them, use the modern terminology. A simple calculation showed that this does not invalidate the time squared law, but it reduces the value of the acceleration by a factor of 5 over 7. Galileo also made further studies of motion that do not require time measurements. He let balls roll down an inclined plane, at the end, and at the end of the plane they were deflected horizontally and then allowed to fall freely until they hit a horizontal plane. The time squared law implies that the path of free fall is a semi-parabola, so that by seeing how the length and the angle of the inclined plane was related to the point of contact on the horizontal plane, Galileo could verify the correctness of the law. One of the most familiar stories about Galileo, also due, due to Viviani, is that he dropped two different weights from the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and that, to the dismay of the watching Aristotelians, they hit the ground at the same time, thus disproving Aristotle's law. If ever he did that experiment, however, and if he succeeded in releasing them exactly at the same moment, which is not as easy as it sounds, Careful observation would have shown that, due to air resistance, the heavier body would have hit the ground slightly before the lighter body. And this, of course, is quite different from the proportionality given by Aristotle. Galileo also considered the fall of bodies in a medium. As an example, he chose two balls of lead and ebony. Supposing lead to be 10,000 times and ebony to be a thousand times as heavy as air, he concluded that if they are allowed to fall from a tower 200 cubics high, the lead ball will outstrip the ebony ball by less than four inches. Since a cubic is, is about 10 inches, he is saying that the lead ball outstrips the ebony by less than one thousandth of the height of the tower. And this follows approximately from the assumption that the velocity of the lead ball is reduced by a factor 1 minus 1 over 10,000 and that of the ebony ball by a factor 1 over 1,000. No justification for this conjecture is given and it is clear that the result is hypothetical and not the result of any experiment. Physicists, and Galileo was no exception, are sometimes prone to imagine that they have such a firm grasp of a particular phenomenon that they can confidently say what is going to happen without making any experiments. Frequently their confidence is justified, especially when they are making qualitative predictions, but sometimes they are wrong, and many instructive examples could be given from the history of science. Quantitative speculations, like that of mentioned above, are much more shaky. When he came to consider the motion of projectiles, Galileo was faced with a pro problem of combining the unnatural motion due to the action of the thrower with the natural motion due to the tendency of all bodies to move towards their natural place. Aristotle believed that they cannot be combined and so that, for example, the shot from a gun is first impelled by its unnatural motion along a linear path in the direction of the barrel and then, when that motion is exhausted, it begins to fall vertically downwards, following its natural motion towards the Earth. Galileo began by considering the simple case when a body is thrown horizontally. The natural motion is its vertical fall, according to the time squared law, 
And the unnatural motion is the horizontal motion that, as will be shown later, has a uniform velocity. And he enunciated the important principle, contrary to Aristotle, that these two motions can be combined vectorially, so that the resulting motion is the sum of the two independent motions, which is a semi-parabola. Galileo considered motion on a horizontal plane as a limiting case of his inclined plane experiments. He found that if he had two inclined planes arranged so that the ball rolls down one and then up the other, then whatever the angle of the second plane, the ball always rolls up to very nearly the same height as it had on the first plane when it was released. Now reduce the angle of the inclination of the second plane until it is infinitesimally close to the horizontal. In the limiting case, it will roll on forever with a constant velocity. In practice, of course, it will eventually come to rest due to air resistance and friction. But as always, Galileo abstracted from such non-essential disturbances. And by a horizontal plane, of course, he evidently meant a plane that is parallel to the Earth's surface, which is essentially flat for practical purposes when small distances are involved. Galileo also studied hydrostatics and floating bodies. The ancient Greeks had discussed the reasons why some bodies float and others sink, and how this depends on their shapes and densities. The achievement of Archimedes in devising a method to determine the presence of base methyl in the king's crown is well known. It is surprising to us that some such simple problems, now easily understood by children, were the subject of impassioned and confused debate for centuries by highly intelligent men. And this reminds us that it was far more difficult than we think to establish the conceptual framework within such within which such problems can be clearly discussed, and that this was largely due to the work of Galileo. Galileo became involved in such problems of hydrostatics during a series of philosophical discussions held in the villa of Filippo Salviati near Florence. An Aristotelian philosopher had may maintained that the action of cold is to condense, but Galileo said that since ice is lighter than water, the action of cold is to rarefy. The philosopher replied that ice only floats because of its shape, whereas Galileo maintained that it floats whatever its shape. At the next meeting, one of the philosophers, Ludovico della Colombe, showed that thin plates of ebony float on water, whereas other shapes sink thus showing that whether the bodies float or sink depends on their shape. This discussion, initially quite friendly, soon escalated into a bitter feud, and Galileo was then told by the Grand Duke to avoid controversy and to confine himself to written comments. So he wrote his Discourse on Floating Bodies, which was published in 1612. Following Archimedes, Galileo said that the upward force on a body immersed in a fluid is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. That is, d multiplied by v multiplied by g, where d is the density of the fluid, v is the volume displaced, and g the acceleration due to gravity. Similarly, the weight of the body is capital V, capital V, g. Thus, the net at upward force is dv minus capital V, capital V, all multiplied by g. And if the body is completely submerged, then capital V is equal to V, and this becomes just D minus capital D multiplied by VG. Thus, whether a body sinks or rises depends on the difference between the densities of the body and the fluid, and that is the important point. According to this, ebony should always sink as it is slightly denser than water. Why then do thin plates of ebony float. Galileo did notice that such plates depress the surface of the water, thus effectively increasing the volume of the fluid displaced sufficiently to keep the ebony floating. However, the full explanation requires the concept of surface tension, which was not at that time known. These considerations 
mark an important advance on the ideas of Aristotle, who said that there were two kinds of motion, one due to a natural inclination to rise, like fire, and the other due an inclination to fall, like heavy bodies. Galileo showed that whether a body rises or falls depends only on whether it is less dense or more dense than the surrounding medium, so that all bodies obey the same law. And this progressive unification of apparently different phenomena is characteristic of the advance of science. Galileo's discussion of floating bodies led him to speculate that motion through water is rather like pushing oneself through a crowd or thrusting a stick into a heap of sand. He thus thought of liquids as composed of multitudes of tiny particles too small to be visible. He also thought that fire provides evidence for the atomic constitution of matter. Democritus maintained that broad plates are able to float by heat particles rising in the water, whereas narrow plates sink because there are too few such particles impinging on them. Aristotle rejected this argument, saying that if it were true, heavy bodies would float more easily in air than in water. Galileo considered this argument to be incorrect because bodies weigh more in the air than in water, and also there is no reason to suppose that fire atoms move more rapidly in air. He suggested that, that a thin, broad plate of, of a material slightly denser than water be placed on the bottom of a vessel filled with water. On heating, the fire atoms, if they can support it on the surface, should be able to raise the plate. However, this does not happen, and so he concludes that the fire atoms are not able to provide the full explanation for the floating of such bodies. Galileo also considered evaporation and boiling, and said that he could see millions of small spherical globules of fire rising through water when it is heated and passing through the surface in, into the air. He rejected the view that got globules are water changed by the fire into vapor because the level of the water never falls however long it is boiled. This is an instructive example of a failure of Galileo's method. He believed that he could, on the basis of a few experiments, understand the principles governing the behavior of a particular phenomenon. After that, simply by deductive reasoning, he could say with confidence what would happen in a large variety of circumstances that had not been experimentally investigated. Often this method worked quite well, but if the understanding is in any way faulty, it inevitably leads to false conclusions. It is very easy to see only what we want to see, and of course, we want to see behavior in accord with our own theories. His speculations about heat were more successful when he said that it is not the fire corpuscles that give sensation of heat, but their motion, and thus explains how a stone or a stick can be heated by rubbing. This changes them into very subtle flying particles, or perhaps releases fire corpuscles, and these produce the sensation of heat. Galileo also considered the strength of materials. He wanted to understand why it is that when machines are constructed, quote, the larger machine, made of the same materials and in the same proportions as the smaller, will correspond to it with perfect symmetry in all respects, except, except that of strength and resistance to breakage. The larger it is, the weaker it will be, end of quote. This phenomenon is also notable in the animal world. An elephant has to be more massively constructed than a gnat. At first sight, this seems to reveal a discrepancy between matter and geometry, between physical and mathematical divisibility. And to understand this requires a consideration of the strength of materials. And this led Galileo to think about the ideas of continuity, the vacuum, and the atomic structure of matter. It has been suggested by Redondi that Galileo's atomistic explanation of sensory perception has heretical implications for the dogma of Eucharistic transubstantiation, 
and that this is the real reason for his trial and condemnation. This suggestion is based on a single document that, is, that in fact has nothing to do with the trial and so there is no basis for Edondi's claim. Galileo was also interested in the velocity of light and in his dialogue concerning two new sciences he describes an experiment to determine the velocity of light. Two people, each with a lantern, stand several miles apart. The first uncovers the lantern and then immediately the light is seen by the second, he uncovers his lantern. The first then measures the time that elapses from the moment he uncovers his lantern to when he sees the light of the second lantern. This time, divided by twice the distance between the two people, gives the velocity of light. However, it was found that the time was immeasurably small and so the experiment failed. And we now know that the velocity of light is so great that such experiments are bound to fail. However, an interesting sequel is that the first reliable measurement of the velocity of light was made by Roma by observing the eclipses of the satellites of Jupiter, which of course were first observed by Galileo. These were found to occur rather later than expected when Jupiter was far from the Earth compared with the times when Jupiter was near. And this was due to the time taken by the light to travel from Jupiter to the Earth. And from this, the velocity of light was determined for the first time. Galileo also tried to develop a method of determining longitude at sea by observations of the satellites of Jupiter. And although this is possible in principle, it was found to be impractical because at that time it was not possible to measure the time at sea with sufficient accuracy. This, however, was achieved later by Harrison. Galileo's method, however, has proved useful in surveying on land. Galileo also thought a great deal about scientific method. When he was a young professor in Padua, he was strongly influenced by the writings of the Jesuits teaching at the Collegio Romano, particularly the Jesuits Menu, Vela, Ruggierius, and Villateschi, and he based his lectures on their work. These Jesuits accepted Aristotle's definition of science and treated logical and quiz physical questions in a realist way following Aquinas, and this follow formed the solid basis of Galileo's subsequent work. Galileo realized more clearly than anyone before him that the primary task of the physicist is to understand the world as it is, to penetrate behind the apparent complexity of phenomena to the often surprisingly simple reality beneath. Thus when he considered freely falling bodies, he wanted to establish the laws obeyed by all bodies whatever shape or material. He therefore considered fall in a vacuum, but as this cannot be realized in practice, he chose the best approximation, namely the fall in air of smooth, hard balls. The physicist is almost never able to make an experiment in an ideal situation, so it is necessary to consider all the unwanted influences that could affect the final result, and to make allowance for them. And this all often requires a subsidiary experiment to study and quantify these influences. And this evaluation of perturbing effects is a vital component of the art of scientific investigation. Galileo also distinguished between primary and secondary qualities. He pointed out that all bodies have a shape and a size, and it is, it is in a particular place at a particular time that is moving or say stationary and so on. These are primary or central qualities and cannot be separated from the body. On the other hand there are other secondary qualities such as color, taste and smell that although they are grounded in the properties of the body are in themselves sensations that exist only as they are perceived by the observer. Scientific research is thus essentially concerned was studying the primary qualities of bodies. In his research, Galileo combined the insights of Aristotle and Plato and went beyond them. Like Aristotle, 
he insisted on the primary importance of experience, of the knowledge that comes to us through the senses. This knowledge, however, cannot be taken at its face value, but must be tested by combining it with other experiences and uniting them all by a general principle or theory. This theory cannot be deduced from the experiments. It is a creation of the human mind. The theory should not only have consequences that agree with the original experiences, but usually also predicts a range of other experiences that enable it to be tested. In order to specify these new experiences, we need not only our Aristotelian logic, but also mathematics. The theory and the mathematics refer to an ideal world and are thus platonic in nature. Theories are tested by making experiments, and the conditions are chosen so as to be as close as possible to the ideal situation. If the results disagree with a the theory, then the theory must be modified so as to be consistent with the new experiences and then tested again. It is not necessary to make a very large number of experiments. Due to the uniformity and rationality of nature, a few well-chosen experiments suffice. There are many practical difficulties in carrying out this program. What experiences do we start with? Usually this is indicated by an existing theory. If this has a mathematical character, it is necessary not only to observe, but also to measure. The construction of the theory depends on the insight of the scientist and cannot be specified by a set of rules. It may therefore be wrong in a fundamental way, or more frequently, it may be inadequate in one respect or another. Its consequences are likely to be very extensive, and it is not easy to choose the ones that make the sharpest test and are yet relatively easy to carry out. If there is a disagreement, is it due to a defect in the experiment, or does it show a real defect in the theory? And if the latter, then how should the theory be modified, and so on? As the theories become more sophisticated and agree with a wide range of experience, they may be said to give genuine, though sim still limited, knowledge about the world. As confidence grows, it becomes less necessary to make experimental tests, and this is certainly true of the laws of motion. However, it has always remains possible that new experiences show the inadequacies in the theory that require it to be modified, and there are many examples of this in the history of science. Galileo was thus neither a pure Aristotelian nor a pure Platonist. He could with justice claim that he was a better Aristotelian than many of the professed Aristotelians who criticized him. He, like Aristotle, observed nature and did not seek the answer to questions only in books. If Aristotle had been able to look through a telescope, he would have certainly modified his views. Likewise, Galileo was a good Platonist by his stress on the importance of mathematics, which Aristotle undervalued. However, Plato considered that the material world is an imperfect copy of the ideal world, whereas Galileo believed in the possibility of an exact ma mathematical description. Galileo never formulated a fully articulated theory of the scientific method. Indeed, this is still the subject of controversy today. He was a pioneer with a vision of the future and had to develop his tools as he tackled new problems. He was primarily interested in solving problems, not, explaining the, not in explaining the methods he used to solve them, which he made up as he went along. Yet in so doing, he was inevitably throwing doubt on the traditional Aristotelian natural philosophy, and this could have the most far-reaching and serious consequences. Structures of thought are linked together far more tightly than is generally supposed. So it is not possible to modify one section without affecting the others. This was clearly seen by many of Galileo's opponents and ensured their opposition, even if they were unable to mount any effective criticism of his actual scientific work. And in the next lecture, I will discuss Galileo, the astronomer.